probably one of my unconscious driving forces is I'm trying to solve homelessness so I don't end up on the streets. I started something called InvisiblePeople.tv where I travel the country empowering homeless people to tell their own stories. Part of being homeless is being lonely. We had a house at one point. We had everything and it fell apart. When I was about ready to become homeless, did you see that coming? The number one thing that I want people to know about homelessness is we can solve it. Rick, we're here right at the mouth of a tunnel, Vegas. You say this is your summer home. Yeah. How long have you been out here homeless? Uh, been in and out of these tunnels for six years. Wow. How do you survive? Uh, panhandling, washing windows, uh, pumping gas, odd jobs here and there. Uh, that's basically about it. Uh, I go out, I try to earn what little change I can instead of just standing around on the corner somewhere or standing around just chasing people. Hey, give me some change, which is why I've been able to survive so long on this block. Uh, actually, the, the businesses and the people around here in this little neighborhood, they haven't just ran me off or, you know, they've allowed me to survive here, you know, basically. So what's your future like? Well, there was a point in time where I thought I didn't want one, didn't have one, you know. Well, a lot of that's changed in the last well, last year. If you had three wishes, what would they be? <sighs> wow. Uh, be self-sustaining for one thing, where I could be able to just go ahead and do the move I want to move and be able to sustain myself and not have to rely on uh, family or whoever to help me. Actually, right now, that's really about it. I mean, uh, as, far, as far as anything else, recently I've been able to accomplish a lot. So, well, thank you very much for talking to me. You're welcome. Last night, we were walking by and a girl probably in her 20s, maybe younger because the streets age you. And uh, she's living like underneath that overturned couch over there. She just crawled up in there. She was so skinny. Um, it was more than your just normal uh, malnourishment. Uh, she was definitely at risk. And this is America. I started something called InvisiblePeople.tv where I travel the country empowering homeless people to tell their own stories. Whatever you say, raw and unedited, you don't have to do it. It goes on a website called InvisiblePeople.tv. Now, how long have you been out on the streets? This is my first day. Today's my 18th birthday. We have a very serious problem in recognizing homelessness in this country. People have grown up in America thinking homelessness is part of the landscape, and we don't expect that it's solvable. How long you guys been out here? Too long. Too long. 
long, what's too long? What Mark is doing with Invisible People is he's like, hey, they're you? still here, there's still people here. Whoa, over here, under this bridge. And he's this alarm bell that I hope he keeps ringing that alarm until there's nobody left. This is homeless. I mean, $29 a night, $30 a night. Yeah. You know what I mean? This looks like one of the better hotels. Yeah. Yeah, this is the best one yeah. at that price. You know? Yeah. Now, these guys are a married couple with five kids. Wow. She works with them. Hey, how are you? I'm fine. Wow, look at all you guys. Is there any way to get some more lights or? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Ty, open the, no, the no, open no, Just because cameras are just so bad with low light cool gene yes we're here in a weekly rate hotel mm -hmm. you're here with your five kids and your husband yes you're homeless yes tell me about it i consider anywhere that i'm with my children our home so i try not to use the word homeless <laughs> um but we've been here about six months uh we had a house at one point, we had vehicles, <laughs> we had everything and it kind of just, it fell apart. And it's a very humbling experience. I lost my job, I couldn't find another one, was living off of savings. Um, we lost our house because of it, we oh. moved here. You're working now, right? Oh yeah, I work at the McDonald's in Winsville, which is something I thought I'd never do. <laughs> but um, it's a full-time job and it gets us by, but it doesn't get us by. If I miss a day, we're pretty much SOL. <laughs> what does it feel like as a mom raising five kids in a small room, especially after coming and having your own home. I know, but at one point when this is all happening, you feel like a failure. And then you think, you know what? There are still people worse off than you. There are people who are living under bridges. So I'm very grateful. If you had three wishes, what would they be? A home for them to run around like they used to, play in the yard, and just a steady good job. That's it, that's all I want. Well, thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you. <laughs> And this is, um, you leave and you just feel their pain, you know? Hi, YouTube. My name is Mark. Many people know me as Hardly Normal on Twitter. So today is InvisiblePeople.TV Day on YouTube. Oh my gosh, I am so grateful and so excited because today we're going to scream real loud about homelessness and poverty and actually make history. YouTube can be a full-time job. Many big YouTubers spend a day responding to comments after upload. There's a thousand comments just on this one. I mean, every video has been getting commented on.
So here's about Jean that we interviewed. There really needs to be more opportunities made for these people. Everything she's talking about is true. That's why America sucks. The economy on your head and doesn't care if you lose your home or job. <laughs> in Europe, people care about one another. Eh, you still have the same stuff in Europe. Actually, over here in Scotland, people are wads. <laughs> No one told her to have five kids. Before you start feeling sorry for her, remember she did not this to herself. Take her kids away and put them in foster care and sterilize her. People like her ruin society. You don't engage extreme ignorance because those people are never gonna change their mind anyways. All they're looking for is conflict. And it's a hard one to do because sometimes I get pissed. You know, we spend billions of dollars killing people in war, including our own, and this woman doesn't have a home for her children and a job not paying minimum wage. Gives you something to think about next time you complain about something trivial. My heart goes out to her and her family. See, I mean, a lot of people are supportive. There's, um, and, and they're talking to each other. Low estimate, 1.5 million people watched a homeless video that would never roll down their window at an exit ramp and said, What's your story? Mark's always been good at taking an idea and actually making it happen. And, uh, and especially making an idea happen in the context of where it can go. Technology and social media, social networking, they were right at the start. I mean, Twitter was barely getting out the gate and people were still trying to figure out what it was. And Mark's ability to ride the wave of this and, uh, and really get in at the ground floor was something that was uh, quite remarkable. He is a homelessness activist and his site, you can find him online at invisiblepeople.tv slash blog. Uh, happy to welcome Mark Horvath. How are you? Just struck by how good he was at this whole social media thing, which, you know, I had maybe 25 friends on Facebook or something at the time, you know. Social media is a big, giant cocktail party. Social media is really real life. It just allows instant online collaboration with people that I never would have met. In social media, it's frequently meeting an old friend for the first time. Um, this is the first time I've actually gotten to touch this guy, but we've learned about each other through pictures, through words, through little teaspoons of, of information on Twitter. He's an old friend. We know all these people all over the world. Many of them, neither of us have ever met. But they're old friends. Hi. Awesome. It's so nice to meet you. You actually look like your avatar. I do. You do. <laughs> a couple real serious crises happened in my life. I had lost my confidence. Oh, wow. I stopped being yep. myself. And social media has given me back that confidence. And this is my friend RD. This is a person who takes invisible people and makes them incredibly visible. This is a human experience. I might be using technology, but I'm still in the real world. When I started, honest to God, I said, nobody's gonna watch, nobody's gonna listen, because it's like the late night TV with the kids with the flies on their face. And then it's the people of social media who started listening, watching, looking, supporting, retweeting, engaging, and, and really adopting the homeless cause through invisiblepeople.tv. Well, you're cleaning? You want me to finish cleaning? Mm. No? Yeah. Okay. I offered. And you don't interrupt the mom when she's cleaning. So did you ever think I was going to turn out to be a nice guy? No. Because I, I was rotten. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty rotten as a kid, huh? Yeah. Well, uh, up to nine, you were nice. But after nine, you are... 
<laughs> the devil on wheres. <laughs> There's not much of me left down here anymore, I don't think. Remnants of uh, uh, a crazy rock band room. For many years, you know, my bands practiced down here. I sold drugs out of here. We would practice eight hours a day, maybe more, but also drink vodka eight hours a day, maybe more. You know, she says they didn't know, but they knew. What do you need? You need me to get out of the way. Yeah. I'm good at that. 1984 is when you had the stroke. Yeah. Uh, they said I couldn't talk, but I got it back. You told them, screw you, I'm a strong woman. Yeah. You know, what did you think when I was about ready to become homeless? Did you see that coming? Oh, yeah. The reason I was first homeless was 20 years of drugs. $300 a day drug habit I had to feed, and I sold pictures of my iguana to tourists on Hollywood Boulevard. Hopeless, discouraged, you know, gosh, what? how did I get here? How am I going to get out of here? By this time, I had been so wasted on drugs, I had mental illness. I walked the San Fernando Valley thinking I was Jesus Christ, and I called home for Bible references. And that scared the guacamole out of my stepfather and mom. You allowed me one collect phone call a day, yeah. mm -hmm. which I would call, and I would use it to manipulate you to send me money. Yeah. Which is why I, I, you know, everybody manipulates. And I am so conscious of it, and I think it's because of that particular time. Roger told me he will get all better or he will die. And I, I, I thought, um, I, I almost killed me. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. That's one of my regrets is yeah. what did did to you. I, But, um... Probably one of my unconscious driving forces is I'm trying to solve homelessness within the next five, ten years so I don't end up on the streets. What's your name? Uh, Caleb. Hey, Caleb. Yeah. Caleb. <laughs> We're here in Ann Arbor, Michigan at um, a tent city that uh, people came up with, Camp Take Notice. Tell me about you and living here homeless in this tent city. Camp Take Notice um, is uh, based on the model that I lived inside of when I was in Seattle, tent city three and four. Um, and while I was out there, I, I became, uh, I fell in love with what the tent community did for a population of people that don't usually have uh, a peer group, um, a friend network. Now, um, how did you end up homeless in Seattle? Um, so in my 20s, I was a paramedic, and my, my malfunction is major depressive disorder. Ended up losing uh, my job because of, uh, because of uh, absentee days, uh, because of the depression. And when I lost that job, I came, became uh, ashamed and embarrassed of my dependent uh, status. And I didn't want to be around friends or family uh, locally uh, in that condition. I didn't want people to see me that way. So I decided uh, that if I moved at a distance, I could be dysfunctional where nobody knew who I was. You found community in a tent city. Yeah, it's been one of the great surprises of my life to, to discover that a group of people as broken and dysfunctional as the homeless can actually come together and work on common issues. We'll get people who heard this is out here and want to come check it out, or you know, their first time they come out here, they're wasted drunk, you know, and they're like, listen, you know, we don't mind having you here, but you can't be here drunk, so go sober up and come back. And it's security's job to escort them out when they get in that condition. So we take turns with it. It's not always the same people that are security. You know, we, everyone has to take a turn doing it. And do you feel safe here? I do. 
but I come from a pretty violent background where I'm going to feel safe just about anywhere. So. I love this model, but this is a slap in the face of homeless services. If there was homeless services that provided shelter and care, you guys wouldn't be living in a tent. Well, there is, there is homeless services for some, but as soon as they started to get overloaded and overbooked, uh, if you're younger, healthier, right. you have any source of income, anything going on whatsoever, they're quick to shuttle you out the door. In the process of throwing you out of the homeless shelter, um, they uh, let you know about the uh, tent city. You know, that's one of the options that they point out to you. What we're experiencing now is a heightened degree of compassion fatigue towards homeless individuals. At the same time, it's becoming more and more a part of our everyday lives. It's now something that you're gonna see at the end of your street. It's gonna be someone that you know from your church or your synagogue or your school. So we need to really understand it as a country because not only are we responsible and accountable, but we really need to recognize this as who we are. And while I was out there, I, I really, uh, fell in love with what the tent community did for the population that the community should have. There's a three to four month window for a person who is newly homeless that um, you have to reach them and turn around their situation before they start to put on that survival mentality. Right. Because you think differently when survival is your primary focus. And usually when you, you're down in this situation, it's easy for you to get depressed because you have so much a lonely time and you're unemployed and you're running into people and you're seeing people seem to try to look down on you. But I think the most important thing is that it, if you don't get so down that you, you give up and you look down on yourself. No jobs in the state of Michigan. It's hard out here, man. And then you get people who treat uh, the homeless people as if they got uh, leprosy. And uh, it's like we're uh, third class citizens. Yeah. And uh, it's very hurtful, you know, very hurtful. What we do observing people who are poor is we tend to attribute their poverty to something about them that created it rather than there's just an economic difference. And so we build a system of support that is based on character improvement to actually fix an economic disparity. Unless we see that there but for the grace of God go I, it's a very a tough bridge to span. Lakeisha. It's okay, it's okay. Yeah. You're here in a homeless shelter. A rotating homeless shelter. Yeah, Tell me about it. Let me look. It's, look in there. it's a different experience. I, I will let you look in a bit. Let me see. I'll let you watch it and when we're done. How's that? I was scared at first. But as I got to know and grow with more people less in that predicament as I am, I changed a lot. I see a lot of things out of perspective of life. And I'm glad I found her in my life. And she's showing me much support. And I thank her. I see now. Now look now. If you had three wishes, what would they be? A home, school, and a job. Thank you very much for talking to me. Thank you. Julie, Jill. hi Jill, I know you, <laughs> we're gonna go around. Work on Matt Reed, how are you? Hi Matt.
Jameer, we're in Chicago. You're homeless. Tell me about it. Part of being homeless is being lonely, and that's one of the worst feelings in the world for me, you know, and I can say for anyone else. How long were you out on the streets? Um, I've been homeless since I was 13. Me being homeless, you know, um, really gave me a wake-up call to life. You know, I'm a senior in high school still. You know, I'm finna push it out, graduate May 27. Good for and, you. And um, that, being homeless and going to school, build character, shows your character, you know, shows who you are. Have a strong mind out here, you know. Um, these streets ain't nothing to play with in Chicago, and yeah. Everybody, here we are in Utah at Salt Lake City, and this is Lloyd Pendleton, and he's the director of the state's homeless tax force. Task force. Task force. Ta I'm not taxing people. <laughs> yeah, that'd be <laughs> a whole different interview. I've been fighting my own homelessness, and it's because of you guys that I'm not only still surviving and not homeless, but I'm able to help other homeless people. What do I have? I'm not really attached to any organization, so it's only social media that has made my activism have any influence or power. Yeah. Okay, let me get out my camera. I got one for each of you. All right. Dude, I love that hat. Cool. All right, thanks very much. You got it. See you guys later. Nice to meet you. How are you, my friend? Oh, hello there. I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, how about that? Where you been keeping yourself? I've been traveling the country helping homeless people. John has been out here for how many years? Six, six, maybe late 96, early 97. Well, I started a video blog to help homeless and you're the very first person I highlighted. Walking down Hollywood Boulevard is really very moving to me because I remember where I came from. You know, I lived homeless. I was John. I slept on this boulevard. When I lived in this park, Everything I owned, I could fit in this backpack right here. And I carried a kitchen knife, which I thought I would use for survival. But more often than not, I sat on this very park bench contemplating suicide. I kept on getting kicked out of the homeless shelter I was at on Hollywood Boulevard, and I saw a flyer for this church, and it said, stand on Hollywood and Ivar, and they pick you up. Well, the bus just drove right by me. So the next week, I stood out there with a Bible and flagged down the bus. And all of a sudden, there's a guy running behind our bus with an iguana on his shoulder, chasing down our bus, saying, I want to come for the free food that night. He was raw, he was rough, living homeless under a bench came into our program, live in this building right here, went through the recovery process. By this time, I had known God was real. I had experienced God. And I started coming here to weekly services. I basically lived here for eight years. So guys, busy day? Yeah? If it wasn't for the Dream Center, just like today, I say, you know, if it wasn't for the people on social media, I would be dead. Well, if it wasn't for the Dream Center. I started a Christian rock band called Under the Influence. It's the first time that rock club ever had 400 men of God in it. 
here's this guy up there and he's just kind of coming off drugs at church, playing the drums and still kind of trying to get himself together. But I thought, you know what? Those are the kind of people that need to be playing drums in church. Not the perfect, but the people that are broken. After I got off the streets, I went and started working in the Christian world with televangelists. What today is Kingdom Builder Sunday, and by being a Kingdom Builder, it's just a step in faith. It's not about money. It's a step of faith that as you help God build His kingdom, He's going to build your home. And I started buying expensive watches and suits, and I said, oh my gosh, this is it. I've arrived, I'm gonna buy a house. And this thing called the economy hit. Where's your house? The one with the pool. I mean, this is a dream that probably was never meant to be. You know, the white picket fence dream. Going through foreclosure is the worst thing that can happen to anybody. You feel dirty. There's been two major crises in my life, and one was homelessness, and one was losing my house. But now looking back, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me, because it took me out of pretending that I was a Christian to actually somebody that was a follower of Jesus. Where I am at today is that I don't want to listen to some guy on Sunday morning talk about Jesus. I want to be out on the streets and loving on people and filling needs. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. He's out hiding. Since Invisible People is just growing, there's no salary. There's no way that it can support me at this time. So I work a full-time job at a homeless services in Los Angeles. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's him. Where? Right, right up there. Right up there to your right. Yeah. Bad to happen. Tell me what you're going to help me with anything else. Well, we're close. We're closest we've been in three years to get you into housing. I was a street outreach worker, and our mission was to identify people that were particularly vulnerable because of their mental illness or addiction. And if we felt they might be a danger to people, we would take them to Bellevue Hospital. Two or three weeks after the hospitalization, that same person would be back on the street. The repetition of that cycle began to be very disturbing and began to raise a number of questions of like, what are we doing? Hey, how are you? Good. Did you find work? Uh, not yet. Not yet? Yeah. And that person just spent 30 days in the hospital at $1,500 a day. We could have bought them a, a condo, you know, certainly paid the rent for a long time. How are you? I'm here. I'm living, breathing. Yeah. So you, you want to go to rehab? Mm hmm So we'll start working on that. that that's exactly what I want to do. Yeah. Dude, I've been on the streets for almost five years, bro. I want, I want to get out of here, yeah. man. And if I'm out here, I can't do it. Right. Easy access. Oh, yeah. I know. You know. Who wants to do homeless sober? <laughs> You're right. It's hard to do. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to do homeless sober. I know it. Well, I'll see you tonight. Okay, bro. Stay safe. You okay? I just want to get off the streets. I want you off the streets. Tiny. We've created a subculture that takes care of homelessness, but not really solving the fundamental problem, which was building affordable housing, uh, increasing the minimum wage to a livable wage. And that's probably why we have more homeless people falling out of the uh, mainstream. Way, way right there by the door, that's the line. Where'd you find what corner? Uh, Glendale and uh, Los Feliz. Okay, I'll talk to her. So how can I help you? 
Um, I don't know. I'm homeless. I don't know. Yeah, you, have you eaten? No. Okay. Right now. Okay. Christina, come here, please. <laughs> please. Okay. Housing is the most important thing to a homeless person, regardless of mental illness or addiction or anything else. And once they're housed, they'll consider maybe treatment, maybe reconnecting with family, maybe looking for a job. But the first response was always housing. Okay. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. This picture was taken in 2000. These people don't look that sick, do they? They don't look like they're going to die really soon. All right. Only two of them are still alive right now. So that's how lethal homelessness is, and that's what everyone in this room is going to do everything we can to stop. The Vulnerability Index is a survey that's administered to people who are sleeping outside or in the shelters. It takes about 10 minutes, um, and it finds out how long they've been out there, what health conditions they have that are associated in the research with a high mortality risk. We get their name, date of birth, social security number, and their picture. So that's what we're looking for, the people on the streets with the highest risk of dying who've been there the longest. And it's really important that you sincerely communicate to people this isn't mandatory. You don't have to do this. If you change your mind halfway through, we'll stop and that nothing bad will happen. All right. Need your team together. We don't want you to lose anybody. Make sure you write down myself and Dennis's cell phone number. If you get lost, if something bad happens, or if you're lonely, give us a call. Hi everybody, uh, here it is, four in the morning in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I'm with Mayor Barry. Morning. I was just really impressed with your leadership and you for being the champion to make this all happen. Can you tell me about it? Well, when you can get a community like this to come together to really go out and try to alleviate the human suffering side, we're just really proud that we got a, an opportunity to, to get the community together and do something right. positive here. Good morning. Going out and doing this with the end goal of housing 75 people. And that's amazing. My name is Mark. Honored to meet you. How long have you been out on the streets? Not including the time I was spent in uh, jail and prison. About nine and a half years. Uh, where do you sleep more frequently? Camp. OK. I don't go to the shelters unless I have to. You've never been there, so you don't know. Uh, I haven't been here, but I, I've been in shelters all around the country. Um, violent attacks? Against me or? Yeah, out here on the streets. Oh, yeah. Everybody has. I know. It's sad. Especially uh, one, one time when I got passed out, they tried to kill me. Wow. What are you guys doing? Wow. Hi, we're doing a vulnerability index to try to uh, help people with uh, the homeless population, uh, health and housing. I need housing. Awesome. You want to do a vulnerability index? I'm vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how long have you been out on the streets? I'd say off and on for about 10 years. OK. Uh, and you know, all the issues being treated? Uh, no, but uh, I'm, I'm losing my mind out here slowly, I'm pretty sure. Uh, were you in the military? Yes, I was. And discharge? Honorable. Jail? I've been in jail. Prison? Never. Uh, foster care, were you in foster care? Yeah, I was in an orphanage for the first 10 years of my life. How do you survive? What's the day like on the streets? It's cold outside, try to stay as warm as you can. Cling to the sun, the sun's your, like your blanket. You've been in the emergency room four times in the last year. 
Uh, what were the reasons? Confrontations, violent confrontations. You know, move along or get get off my property or wow. all kinds of different reasons. You know. If you had three wishes, what would they be? Oh, one of them would be uh, to uh, have a place to stay, a place to live. I miss being domestic. You know, I'm kind of losing that feeling as time goes by. And I'm kind of worried about that. I don't want to be like some of, some of these people out here. They've been out here for years and they're getting used to it. Last year, there was this big event, the 1287. There's 1,287 homeless people in this area. And a group of homeless people showed up. Just gentlemen in the blue first. So I decided to call them down, and I interviewed them live. Do you want to come down and speak? Come on. <laughs> and your name is? My name is Judy. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I've been homeless for three months and I have health problems, and I'm fighting real hard. I'm out in the heat 24 seven, and nowhere to go. Um, sometimes I feel like I need a nap, and there's nowhere to go. Um, I'm a good person. I have a kind heart. I help everyone. I, I just wanted people to know my story. I've been here all my life. Thank you. Wow. But the one that really got me was David. David is just this kind man. And I remember talking to him last year. I didn't know David was homeless. I thought he was, <laughs> but I, I wasn't quite sure. I sat next to him and I just started talking. I had my Yankees hat on and I think we were trying to talk baseball or something, you know, and just started a conversation. He said, I'd like to help, but I just don't know what to do. Well, I really didn't have a big game plan for him, but I just said, <laughs> I just said, well, you know, there's no place to go for breakfast. Um, Seven Hills wasn't open on Saturdays. And I said, maybe you could start a breakfast or something. So that morning, Henry took him to breakfast, breakfast and a relationship developed. When it rains, I started thinking, oh my goodness, what's David up to? I hope he's okay. And uh, David's no longer homeless. I went from sleeping in a camp, in a tent, to being an apartment manager the next day. So that's just God's work. This is kind of weird. This is a guy because I came and visited here that's been housed, and I don't know how to react. I don't know, you know, so. Don, this is Mark. Hey, man. This hey, is Mark. Don House. Guys? Honor to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you. <laughs> Come on in, everybody. Don. You have to get another picture with Caitlin. Absolutely. Come on. Go, I didn't go. do anything. There you right. go. Yeah, you did. One, two, three. <laughs> Just because we get someone off the street and into a home doesn't mean that everything's fine and dandy. I think sometimes in our culture, especially today, we want to fix it. And getting a homeless person into a house um, solves the condition, but it doesn't really address the whole person. And I think Mark has really challenged me to think long term, saying, you know, how do we care for this person who is in a house now a year later? This didn't exist last year, and I think with Mark's visit provided really kind of a catalyst and a rally point for our community. We harvested yesterday almost 300 pounds of produce for the soup kitchen and for their distribution there. Let me 
see. He's a little shorter. Let me go to. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Looking good. Rolling. Hi, everybody. Here we are in Pittsburgh, and I'm with Dr. Jim Withers. And this is truly an honor because he goes out on the streets. He does the house calls to homeless people. Swallow those, you don't chew them, okay? Oh, I don't chew no pills. Because it'll make your mouth go numb. No. All right. But it's and good. And I for, take one it, of these three times a day. Yeah, yeah. Swallow it, and it'll help your cough. Okay. If you feel worse, you get a hold of us, okay? Or go to the hospital. Yeah. Okay. If you're, if you're able. Okay. We're out here with Dr. Jim, and you have a cold. I had a cold for two weeks. It's, it's tough, man, being sick out here. <laughs> I'm okay. I, I I try to do the best I can do. If you had three wishes, what would they be? Three wishes. Number one, get up off these streets. Number two, to have all my kids living with me. Number three, for me to be able to help somebody else that's homeless. Thank you. <laughs> There's a real disconnect between our brothers and sisters who are sleeping on the streets or in these uh, very difficult conditions and uh, the whole society. They don't know who to turn to, they don't have insurance, and they get rejected by the health system. They don't actually believe anyone cares enough, so they, they've given up. It's time for us to get out of the hospital, get out of wherever we're in, to start talking to people, listening to them, and in solving problems with them. You have to deal with the reality of someone else, not have them come to your reality. Dale. Yes, sir. How are you? That's your play, sir. Oh my gosh, you look better than last year. <laughs> if you think about the kind of community you want to live in and the kind of community you want to raise your children in and who we are as a people in terms of do we care for each other? Do we care for the weakest or the poorest or the uh, most vulnerable among us or not? And what does that say about our own character? If I give you the money, will you go buy me a couple of hamburgers at McDonald's? You just need hamburgers? Yes, that's all I need is something to eat. You anything to drink? No, I don't. OK. I'll be right back. Not me. Are you sure? I'm positive. You asked the right guy. <laughs> I started off today uh, with some tweets, you know, saying thank you to Ford and Pepsi and Matthew Barnett and 100,000 homes. And I, I start getting, you know, very teary eyed and grateful, you know, to all of you as I say thank you. And then I, I end it with all the homeless people that we met. They're still out on the street. <laughs> it's almost too much. Okay.
takes a little shine. It takes a little time to design the stars around the moon. You pull the quiet close in. You pull the quiet from the two fireflies. Eleven thousand six hundred and eighty-six miles. Ah, what a long, strange trip it's been. The number one thing that I want people to know about homelessness is we can solve it. Robert, we're here in Sacramento. You're homeless, living in a tent city. Tell me about it. June 15, 2007, I worked for a property management for four and a half years. I came with housing. I had 72 hours to get off the property, and I became homeless. I never thought I'd end up on Skid Row out here, sleeping on docks and in back of businesses and everything, but that's what I guess I'm going to have to do. I don't know. Um, if you had three wishes, what would they be? For everybody to have a place to stay where we can gather our thoughts and think about what we can do. If anybody's listening, that's all. It's not about me, it's about us. It's not about safe ground. It's not about it running around like a terrorist clandestine camping and all that stuff, it's not about that. This isn't our lifestyle. We just want a place to go. Thank you very much for talking to me. Monster. 
At Home is brought to you in part by the Because Foundation and Because Films, finding innovative solutions to complex social problems. The Pierce Family Foundation, building the capacity of nonprofit organizations to help meet the needs of people experiencing homelessness. The Irving Harris Foundation, the Exelon Corporation, and generous donations from friends and supporters. To order your DVD or Blu-ray of At Home or to host a community screening, please visit athomedocumentary.org store or call 773-728-8489.